So for today, though, I wanted to uh, introduce our speaker. So um, Mark D'Agostino is our speaker today. Um, so he helps companies build organizational alignment through human resources. Uh, Co-founded Connected HR in 2014 based on his experience as an entrepreneur and his search for scalable expert human resources support that small businesses need to grow. Today, Connected HR is one of the fastest growing HR consulting companies in the greater Cleveland region. And so today he's going to talk to us a little bit about some of the most pressing HR issues that small business owners face in returning to work in our current climate. It's so nice to be here. Um, I know this group has gathered one other time in the last year plus. So this is, this is really great. Um, so I'm not going to talk so much about HR as kind of the state of what I'm seeing for small business. Um, feel free to throw a question out. So if I can't, if, if I talk a little soft, just yell out and I'll talk louder. Um, so what, ha what has happened in the small business world is crazy right now. And all the companies that we work with, we're seeing the same repetitive problems, issues, et cetera. So we put a little slide together to talk about human resources, but what we're really wanting to talk about is how small businesses can be agile and move around and compete with the larger businesses for talent. So that's what the focus is going to be on that we're going to talk about this morning. Okay. So being agile is about being able to understand, adapt, and change quickly in an ever-evolving environment. This environment is chaos. It's crazy. It's like nothing we've ever seen as a society, as a group of business people, and as human beings. And this isn't going to lighten up anytime soon. So when I think of HR and I think of small business, I think of how to be flexible, how to be agile, how to adapt, how to understand what's going on and not become too entrenched of the things of the past that will hold you back and slow you down. So we're gonna focus right on recruiting to start. Um, it's everywhere in the media, the great resignation that you're hearing about. I'm gonna give a story about a, a local entrepreneur who moved here from New Jersey, moved his family here to start a business in Cleveland. He does market research. Had a customer service person, $55,000. Had worked for him for a couple years. He said she was the perfect employee had given her raises, she had a great job, she loved her job. Glassdoor came in from the West Coast and paid her $90,000 to work remotely. So, of course she left. Why wouldn't she? Couple small kids at home, easier for her to do that, and she's making a heck of a lot more money. This is what the small businesses are challenged with in certain industries in certain positions. Um, it's, it's almost like a hostile takeover of your employees. Now this doesn't apply to every industry, but it applies to most small businesses. So we talk about that. Uh, we've seen this multiple times with, with different organizations. So how do, you, how do you pull in talent? I didn't get into the keeping your talent portion because most businesses that were seeing are growing and they need people, whether because people are leaving or they're just in a growth mode. Um, we've hired six people since November in our small company. It was hard to get those people in. There were less applicants coming through. So let's focus a little bit about recruiting. Recruiting is a very tough thing for small businesses. Small businesses typically struggle with positioning themselves the right way to pull in the talent. So it is anybody that has a small business that focuses on sales, you have to think of recruiting as sales. And you've probably heard that before. It's incredibly true. If you don't sell your company to people, you won't get the right people in the door. It's just a fact. I have a sales background, a business development background since I was 19 years old. I went to Cleveland State University. I put myself through school. I was in a commission sales position and I did that all the way until I started my first organization. And so I know how to sell. This is what ha companies have to do now to get pulled down and they have to sell to the candidates. It is a candidate market and it's going to be like that for a while. I don't care if you're shoveling snow, hiring snow shovelers. 
I don't care if you're hand, uh, bringing technicians in, CFOs, what have you, you're going to have to sell your company. Um, recruiting is interesting because companies undercook it a lot. They don't invest the time in developing their recruiting processes. You have to, to go into theoretical things when you're work figuring out how to recruit. You do it with sales. You figure out how you analyze the market. You know your customer base. You know the behaviors of your customer. But you have to do that with, with when you're recruiting people into your organization. It's a 101. And I think small business is going to have to catch up fast because the big, the big people, the big players, they know how to do this. Absolutely. They've got the data. They know exactly what to do. So recruiting is, I mean, the, I like this photo because it actually is pulling it in. Small business in the Northeast Ohio region, greater Cleveland footprint, is, is tough. It is a tough, 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 tough area. And they talk about lack of talent, et cetera, et cetera. I don't view it as lack of talent. I view it as a lack of process and a lot, lack of um, expertise by the small businesses to pull, comp pull town in. So I wanted to, I put this slide after because when you talk about bringing town in and retaining them, we don't have time to talk about retention today. Um, that's, a, that's a topic we could probably talk about two hours. Um, so you're hearing hybrid work. It's everywhere in the, in the media. And I'm, has anybody been affected by this, meaning trying to get people to hire people and you're, and you're not able to get them or they're leaving because they can't work a hybrid schedule or a complete state from home? Yeah, so I believe the future of, so I'm gonna project a year or so out, maybe two years out. I think what's going to change is the hybrid work is going to kind of flatten out to a point where it's not gonna be as abrupt as it is right now. Meaning people are really targeting, I wanna work completely remote or I want a hybrid schedule. Not all industries, not all companies can accommodate that. What I do think, and we could talk about that for a couple hours, but what I do think is going to change is the stay home when sick policies. And I think this is where the small business owners, and I'm talking employers 500, 250 and less, are going to have to lock it down. And this is how you're going to help employees feel better about staying with your organization. I was taught, I, I came from a blue collar family. I watched my dad get up to go to work every day at, you know, I didn't watch him get up, but he was up at four o'clock in the morning did his, put his nine, 10 hours in, came home and cut the grass, right? You went, to, you went to work when you were sick, unless you had a fever or you're throwing up. You just, that's what you did. You went to school. You weren't allowed to not, you know, not going was not an option in my household. So that's, that's kind of the, the, the way I was raised. And there's a lot of business owners that were raised like that. So they think, you know, get my workers in here. The new world is going to be stay at home when sick at least for the next five plus years. Obviously pandemic driven, disease driven. You've got to dive into your policies all the way down to the core and look at your PTO, your paid time off policies, and you've got to come up with a good stay at home when sick. Now, how many have employees that would have used that? Everybody does, right? So I think it was Ronald Reagan who said, trust and verify. So when you're hiring somebody, you're hiring them to trust them to do a job. If they're not the right person, they're not going to, they're not going to be, this won't work for them and it won't work for you. Fact. So staying home when sick is here to stay for many, 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 many years. I think that will start to trump the hybrid work. When you're talking tech and people that can work remotely, that's a whole different thing. 
when you have people that have to build machines, analyze machines, collaborate about machines, when you have, we have some architects in the room, you've got to be together. You can't always work separately. So when someone's sick, they should be able to stay home and it should be okay and not frowned upon within your organization. This will propel your organization when you lock down your PTO policies. When we go to work with companies, the number one thing we work with them on, the first thing is PTO, because PTO is sometimes off, most times off. And when people are trying to figure out where they wanna work, they're gonna to wanna to know the expectations of staying home sick. So are you gonna see PTO separate I'm staying at home, like, okay, here's your 10 days, but, you know, if you're sick, you're sick. We're not going to ding you, but if it becomes excessive. It would all be in, that's a good question, it would be all in the PTO policy, right? There, there could be a sick component. You can keep thinking of it linear like that, it's separated, but it's actually all going to be together. Um, you know, people are nervous. I mean, you, you folks are here, you all wore your mask coming in, some had your masks off a little more than others, right? Everybody's different. And the fact that you're here probably means you're a little bit kind of okay with not worrying about as, as much as getting sick, right? Not everybody's like that. We've had, we've had people at companies come into work, take their clothes off, put work clothes on, change their clothes and go back home because they're so frightened that they're going to get something on them and bring it into their family. So the other thing that this does is there's, you're going to see a wave of mental health things that are coming around. So anybody know what an EAP is? So employee assistant program, a lot of insurance policies are have them built in there. Um, company insurance policies, sometimes you're taking out a, a separate EAP policy. Basically, it's a, it, it helps employees. So if someone is dealing with abuse in the home, um, they can talk to a counselor. There's, it's all a set of resources that are, that are available. If someone is experiencing substance abuse personally. Um, if they're having anxiety, you have, you have resources that the EAP provides. And if you don't have it, check your insurance policy with your company, um, whether you're, you're in leadership or ownership, or if you're interested as an employee and that there's no EAP, ask, ask if there is one available. Mental health is going to be a huge, huge component of human resources. And I think it actually has to be led by the human resource professionals within the organization. Um, mental health is really this, this stay at home when sick is really designed to keep people safe. This is a true safe thing. Look, right now we have allergies. There's a summer cold going around, the flu starting up, and then you, it's confusing. You know, even, you know, if I had a little bit of a, a stuffy nose and, and I was coming in here today, I would feel like, uh oh, they, does anybody think I'm sick in here, right? Do I stay at home at that? This is designed to keep people safe and keep, keep the germs out of the office as much as possible and it's okay to stay home. The mental, this, this is a part of the mental health plan that you're going to need to think about in the future for your organization. And it's keeping people calm. Yeah. Are you saying that companies are rolling sick time if you don't use it all to the next year, or are you saying most of it is use it or lose it? Use it or lose it. It's small businesses have a hard time of rolling things over because, for example, in our world, we have we when somebody starts with us, they get in their full time, they get four weeks of vacation right away. That's how we have it built. If we roll that over, they could be you know. It would be very difficult to do that for this in the small business world. So this is what I so that's a great question. So I actually view sick time as separate. So sick time should should be limitless, but there has to be parameters built around it, and it has to be managed, right? Because you're going to have people that could be sick for an extended period of time. And then you have to look at the types of leaves that are available based on the size company you have. But when someone's sick, you don't wanna rush them back into the office. You just wanna be, and this is, it's not necessarily just for them, it's for the others that are working in the office. Everybody has, is heightened sensitive right now. They're nervous.
And if you can keep somebody away and they can keep doing their job, maybe you have a way that they can do a partial portion of their job if they're staying home, you know. Uh, doctor visits, you know, bringing in notes, et cetera, et cetera. There's, um, you know, you can do, what, what's the t telemedicine now is, is, is you're going to see a big wave of that come through. Is requirements or, I mean, I know telemedicine is growing, but are, you, are, are your customers and, Asking you, you know, should we require a note? Do we need verification? It's all good discussion points that's going to go into the policy. It, it has to be, there's no one size fits all. Every organization is different. Every industry is different. Architects might be different from a group of machinists, right? Tech might be different from, you know, finance. Um, so this is where a company should really be investing their time and their policies here. This, I can't stress this enough. Um, I think it's the most important thing you can do. So I wanna to touch on some topics because um, we could sit here and talk about the COVID related things over and over, but diversity and inclusion. So it's a big topic, right? And we live in a pretty diverse area, um, semi-segregated in, in, in the greater Cleveland area. I actually, People jump to diversity and inclusion. I actually think in the work, so we're talking about the workplace. I actually think we should be talking about respect in the workplace. Everybody wants to jump and say this and that, and if you're this, then that, and why can't everybody get along? What's underutilized in the, work, in the workplace right now is respect. People have to understand how to respect each other, and they actually should be trained on it. And it's not heavy training. A lot of the things that happen that are harassment driven in the workplace, or even at hiring, is because people don't respect who's walking through their door, whether it's a, a new potential hire, whether it's an existing employee, family member, etc. So you've got employers need to be all-inclusive right now and it's pushed out into the media so much where everybody feels the pressure to be perfect with it but nobody's perfect with it everybody we're human beings we all have biases right what everybody try really should focus on is showing respect in the workplace if the respect in the workplace was put in place and people were respectful of all situations and all types of people, all genders, all races, all religion, all these diversity and inclusion would, would not even be needed because it's all based in respect. And I don't see respect training out in the work for, in, in the workplace tools and resources that are out there. I see a lot of you know people that are leading diversity and inclusion. They're they're actually hired for the position. Um, I've gone and researched for respect tools and respect training, There's not, they're not there. We were working with a large auto dealer years ago and they had an in-house counsel. So the attorney, they had tons of problems at, at all their different um, dealerships and all spattered out through, through Greater Cleveland. And the in-house counsel said, boy, and it was a great company, they did a great job with their folks and they took care of their employees, great employer but there is a lot of people, so you have a chance of stuff just happening. And that in-house counsel said, boy, it would be really great if we could get everybody trained how to be more respectful at work. So, you know, respect comes in multiple forms. So say you have somebody sourcing individuals, right? And a resume comes through, some, some information comes through. Put the, the re, if you're in a respectful frame of mind, and a respectful platform, you're not going to judge that resume on a, on a name or religion, what school they went to, what color you think they are, what gender you think they are. You're going to take that person and you're going to look, do they fit the role? Do they have the skill set that we need in this company, in this organization? Respectfully passing it on to the next person. So it starts at the beginning. Inclusion. Companies that have, the, all the data that's come in, 
companies that are diverse and have a stronger uh, inclusion plan typically do better in the market. Um, so people from you know, different ages, different genders, um, different religions, uh, including them all, you get a, a broader sense of things that you're bringing into your organization, which in theory makes your company better. It's a fact. What's lacking at times is when they're in the organization, how others are treating with them and working and collaborating with them. And that's where respect comes in. So we could talk about that for a, lot, a long time, but I know we're limited time here. So um, respect, uh, taking time to build a respectful platform and even putting it in writing, what your guidelines are, is a really good idea. So, We'll just touch this briefly. So being consistent and offering feedback, you've heard it. The millennials and the next generation under them that is coming in the workforce, they want feedback. You, you younger folks in here, you want feedback. And lack of feedback are why people leave companies. Lack of feedback are why people struggle to meet their expectations. We're busy. Small businesses only have so many levels of managers. Sometimes we don't have time for that. Andrew? Do you mind providing some quick and dirty best practices on how to provide feedback? Because I'm not saying it's my experience, but <laughs> <laughs> what I seem to see sometimes is people like feedback when it's positive, but whenever it's a more of a constructive nature, uh, the conversation can take a different dynamic to it. How many of you have core values? All right. <laughs> so it's. I think it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And here, I'm going to skip to this one. Train your managers to build a better team. If you train your managers to how to say it instead of focusing on what they're saying, it it's a game changer. So when you think of giving feedback, you have core values. Everything that you should do in your job should all point back to the core values. I used to think this was bunk, quite honestly. I did. And then all of a sudden, I didn't because I started to pay attention to when we were interviewing somebody, hiring somebody, onboarding somebody, and then working with somebody, you know, one or two years, if they weren't aligning back to our core values, they shouldn't be with our organization. And it's so, so hard to do, right? Because you're busy. I'm just going to ignore what Steven does over here because, you know, he's a top producer. Well, Sally over here might be saying, I'm watching what Steven's doing. I don't like his behaviors, right? So you're not being consistent with your employees. They're not aligning back to the core values. So offering feedback to me, it just aligns right back to the core values. And one of our core values at our company is collaborating. Collaborating is a core value. If somebody can't collaborate in our organization, they're not going to survive. They're not going to stay. So when I happen to do a certain set of reviews, and when I do those reviews, I point them right back to the core value. It's not about me criticizing them. It's about me pointing it back to the core value. Do these align with our core values? Same with clients. How many of you have fired clients before? Because they don't align back to your, your core values. I had a mentor. Um, he was the uh, M&A guy for Davy Tree, which is, one I think, the third or fourth largest ESOP in, in the country. And um, Marty Erbaugh was his name. Great guy. And uh, he passed away a couple years ago. Marty told me, you work, for, you work for the believers in your company. And you work hard for your clients that believe in you. Everybody else you push away. So to me, when you're doing, when you're offering feedback, points back to your core values. And you, you talked about them strictly. Not, hey, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong. Did this align back to the core values? Did this help company your clients move things forward? Did you help your team 
within our organization move things forward. It's up to them to come up with the solutions, not you guys. So you're going to ask them, how do, how do we solve this if this isn't happening? It's really hard to do. It's, it's probably the hardest thing to do. Now, skipping over to here, managers have to be trained on that because managers are typically a hiring manager that's hiring this, these folks in or they're doing the evaluation of the folks, right? So the, the managers have to be trained. So with that slide, I'm curious, Mark, so you have trained your managers to build a better team. In order to do that, how would you train your managers to become better recruiters to build that team? That's a good question. Um, it depends. All managers don't recruit. Some of them are part of the interview team or part of the process to bring somebody in. So some managers sit in the hiring seat more than others. It's, it's, a, it's a hard question to, to answer, but again, they have to know what, I don't, I think, so let me, let me skip. I think recruiting is a company effort, not an individual effort. So the company actually should support the managers in their hiring process. And that's not necessarily saying that they won't do all the interviewing themselves, but they should be supported in how they're getting the people in, in some, some form. So, you know, when, you, when you're doing, you've got a job description, right? Then you're posting the job, you're reposting the job, you're sourcing the people that are coming through. There's a lot of steps to it. Um, so the managers, what portion of those steps do they have? Well, it's interesting. I've, I've done executive recruiting for 25 years, and it's always interesting to me when we rely on the HR department to go out and find the people, and yet they're not salespeople. They're usually not the best salespeople in the company. And I, I always find it very interesting that most companies, their strategy is to just go post. Right. Just to know who they really want. I guarantee the New York Yankees Red Sox don't post their positions where they get the best paid player. They go out and try to get it. Yeah. They try to identify who those people are. And I think when you're looking to build your leadership, you really need to be able to identify who they are. Yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a great point and it's very valid. What was, what was in the staffing world, what is the recruiting world? It's market to HR and sell to the hiring manager. I think that's how it goes, right? Um, Start at the top. Yeah. And, you know, so. We have a team of HR professionals. Most of them are master degree. They none of them are recruiters, but they all know how to recruit. And sometimes HR people can block progress on the recruiting side of things. They can, for varied reasons, right? Manager, so they're they're not they're not. I I work with almost twenty HR people. They're not salespeople. <laughs> they're not, and their personalities are all different. And you're right. And we back to what we talked about at the beginning in recruiting, it, it's a sales job right now. And it is, it's off. And in small business, even when companies hire our people, they have, most of the companies that hire us have never had success with human resources. So they bring us in as an outsourced service, right? They're bringing us in and they're expecting all of a sudden recruiting is going to get better. And I have to have the conversation with their HR folks. They can build the process, but there's other people that are involved that are going to help drive this through. Um, I think, you know, there are some managers that are fantastic managers. They're terrible in the interview space, right? A lot of it is so you, you, there's a lot of data driven things that are out there. Behavioral assessments um, are, are a 101 now. So behavioral assessments were usually for the bigger, bigger companies, right? The smaller businesses now they've made it affordable. So you can get for $10,000 a year or less, you can, you can have every possible candidate come in. If you have 10,000 candidates come in, they can take an assessment and you can get a snapshot of what they are. Um, so that's a really, it's, it's all sales driven, it's all data driven. Pretty soon, and I probably in the next 10 years or so, you're going to see somebody's just going to apply and it's automatically going to, and I think UPS or FedEx is doing this now. You apply online and all of a sudden it's, it's spitting out an assessment. They can just buy the questions that they're asking. Is there any psych majors in here? So anybody with psychology background, that's, that's what it's all based on. So when we hire somebody, we do an assessment, um, a behavioral assessment. It shows us their, their work behavioral patterns. 
so we know, and they're put into categories, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I want to just talk about being consistent. One of the things we talk about retention. So retention is actually interwoven in everything we're talking about today. Companies that don't treat their employees consistently, that's it's why people leave. Lack of communication with your employees, it's why people leave. You know, I like this person, I like her better, so I'm gonna to talk to her more often, but I, I don't like him as well, I'm not gonna to talk to him as much. I really don't have anything else then. You guys are welcome to ask some questions. I'll give you examples of the small businesses that we work with and the situations we see. Just a quick question. The content of the presentation is clear. I think businesses, large and small, understand the ocean we're swimming in right now. It's changed dramatically. But by the time a business, large or small, budgets, recruitment, training, sensitivity training, equality training, Managers should manage tasks. They lead people. How to lead. Now, we didn't talk about leadership, which is probably paramount in this whole conversation, right? How do you budget the time to do business? You're training, you have people out, you have consultants coming in, you have someone with a gripe, they may be in the HR office. The dynamic is monstrous. Now you have people, some at home, some not. But somewhere, leadership of the company has to say, by the way, if it's a 40 hour work week from from Bob or a 50 hour work week from you know, Tina, whatever their tasks are, how much of that is being consumed elsewhere? How much of it is productive going to the bottom line so I can afford to do the rest? How do you not budget for it? Exactly. You know, it's a conundrum because it has to be built into a business plan now. But what I think business has to be sensitive to, I don't use business as a responsibility to unwind someone's being raised zero to 18, that's where your biases are gonna be plugged in. Be it socioeconomic, be it political, be it a combination thereof, a different geography that moves from another area or another nation. Today, the dynamics is so different. Even a small business is no longer competing with the guy on the street, with the gal across the road. They're competing with someone in India, China, Japan, you know, yeah. anywhere. So the, the whole dynamic is so different. Yeah. There was a, to your point. So we call that, we'll lump that into the HR, right? You're talking about it on a bigger scale, like from the leadership from top down. We'll lump it into the HR. HR is grossly underserved in the small business segment, grossly. It's why we exist. Um, our company exists. There's a local company, manufacturer, 40 some employees, new president came in. This is like two or three years, three, three or four years ago. He calls us and says, hey, I'm thinking about using your guys' services. Um, I've been the president here for two and a half years. I'm one of the owners. Um, I got to finance, operations, production. I'm finally getting to HR, to your point. That was the low, low thing on the totem pole, right? That was the bottom thing. He was finally getting to that. Um, what's, this is a manufacturing you know, Rust Belt area. We work in Detroit, we work in Pittsburgh, a little bit in Columbus, but Detroit, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, very Rust Belt-ish. Um, HR is not thought of here. It's not thought of up here, it's, it's thought of down here. And this stuff is not complex. This is, this is leaders, rec like, when you say HR, everybody feels like HR is like, like a thing. HR is actually owned by the company, it's not owned by a person. No person owns HR. Somebody will lead that initiative, it could be a CFO, it could be a controller. HR is the company owns the HR department, processes, structure, whatever you wanna call it. And HR stuff in the small business world is completely undercooked. And it affects all these things we talked about this morning. All of it. You know, there was a big, um, anybody in construction in here? Well, the architects work with the construction groups. We have a lot of construction groups that work with us. And all of a sudden, you know, we've been in business for seven plus years, about the first three years, all these construction groups started showing up in our world. Why, why are they all showing up? Well, here's what it was. They 
they realized they were hiring HR, but they were really realizing they were getting an aging workforce and they couldn't figure out how to bring, bring the younger workers in. I'm not talking just about the field folks. I'm talking about people that are in the offices, right? They've had people that are 50, 55, 60, 65. They saw the trajectory of these people were going to retire and there, were no, there was no youth coming into it. And we saw this at company after company after company after company. Why? Because they never invested the time to, do, to develop their workforce, to train their managers, to develop their processes. So all of a sudden, they were business was good. They're busy. right? Everybody's busy, and they're doing things, but they're not investing in bringing the people in, the next wave that's coming in. Making sure when you're bringing in a 25-year-old worker that's a couple years out of college, to sit next to the 60 year old worker who likes to use foul language constantly. These are things that happen in the workforce and they're a big deal to certain people. And um, nobody, you know, back in the day, it was okay to drop the F bomb in, in the construction world, right? In the office, it was, you know, the, the guys, the guys and, and people from the field were coming in and dropping F bombs. Well, the new workforce didn't want to hear that, right? They were uncomfortable with that. So they weren't sticking at these groups. They were going someplace else where that didn't happen. And so now these construction groups, great companies, great employers, driving the economy, building amazing things, they were like, uh-oh, how, how are we gonna solve for this? What do we need to do? And they thought of it as an HR problem and a recruiting problem, but it wasn't. It actually was a leadership problem. And they just needed to, to focus on some of these things and then it, it all went away. It didn't all go away, but they worked on it and it's a process. So there's a, uh, it's a good question. Um, so there in, we're, we're supporting a, lo, uh, a, a U.S. company right now, but we have somebody there five days a week working with them, and we're actually covering someone that's in Canada that's on maternity leave for over a year. So the maternity leaves are different outside of the U.S. <laughs> She's out for a year, and you, you know, some... Some of our clients have put in paternity policies where, in fact, a, a buddy of mine is on paternity leave right now. So I think for two weeks. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a necessity. Do you think the government's going to mandate it though? It depends on, <laughs> at some point, yeah. You know, if, I think if you get, if, if you know, the Democrats are in, I kind of meant to, I don't know if everybody's aware of it, but work from home employees can file workers' comp claims. We found out the hard thing was an employee got up in the bathroom, slipped, fell, broke her wrist, filed a workers' comp claim, and then we can do about it. Yeah. So employment attorneys are having a field day right now. So we train with employment attorneys. Um, we just had somebody in from uh, last week from France Ward, and um, there's all the situations are coming fast and furious. You're going to see a wave of lawsuits come through. It's it's going to be it's an interesting time. It, you know, it'll all the laws will start to change and things will start to adjust. And you know, depending on the administrations and the state that you're in, if it's a red or blue state, you're going to see a lot of things going back and forth. Um, so I, I really don't know. I think I I would just be guessing. In fact, you know, Betsy was in the back there. She was in when we had the employment attorney in, and, and we were asking her questions, and the employment attorney was like, I just don't know. And that's okay because they don't know because the stuff's not finalized yet, right? And it's 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 going to keep moving. You know that's why I go back to the original slide about being agile because you have to be. You know because you know as a small business group you want to put something in place and just be and say you know, this is it this is this is our policy. But guess what? You have to adjust it maybe twice a year. You have to be ready to move move. And the expectation for your employees is that hey. Things are changing, so we, we're going to change along with it. And we're going to communicate to you what we're changing. And we're going to tell you why we're changing it. Uh, all my clients are manufacturers. And Pre-COVID, they were struggling to get people. Now it's, it's even worse. What are your predictions on uh, the unemployment benefits, the child tax credits? You know, a lot of them are just, all right, we're just going to wait till those go away. Then they'll come back to work. But I don't... I don't necessarily see that. What, what are you seeing? Are, are those going to influence? Are they just going to 
you know, not be an impact in terms of getting people back to work? I, I, I can't say because I, I don't know. You know, I think it depends on what the, what the disease, what happens with the disease too, right? You know, supposedly we're on the, the slope down right now. Um, think that's what's keeping people from working? Here's what I think happened this year. So I think, well, obviously the COVID punch in the gut just rocked everyone's world. And I think that the benefits that came out at certain uh, pay scales allowed people to, you know, stay at home, right? I mean, it affected even the Uber drivers. I was out in Arizona. I couldn't, in a re very resort area, I could not get an Uber driver. And the people at the hotel were like, yep, they're all home. So I think what happened is in summer came. So when, when, when did the, when did the was it end of June did the states end? Uh, in Ohio. Yeah, in Ohio. So September. September was, yeah. So summertime came. People were like, yeah, I'm fine. I got a little bit of cash here from this, this money that came in. I'm just going to stay home. Why do I go to work? So that's why you saw kind of a, a lack of, in, especially in the service industry, people coming into work. So I think we've seen more. There's a group here by the clinic that um, we help them. We do their HR, we help them with their recruiting. And we would post jobs and over a typical weekend, we would typically get 25 to 35 applicants. There were many weekends um, since during this year, they got zero, nobody applying, zip. So um, I think when summer came, everybody was kind of like, oh, I'm just gonna chill out, I'm gonna enjoy my summer. And I think as we got you know, kids went back to school. People started to, we saw it spike up a little bit. People are, oh, I'm going to start looking for some jobs now, right? And I think when COVID, the, the Delta variant started to spike, I think it, people said, you know what? I'm just going to pull back a little bit. It's really not worth it for me to do it. And I'm kind of thinking maybe benefits are going to come back at some point. You know, maybe I'll just hunker down here for a while. The other thing that I think is affecting it is all you're hearing of all these open jobs, who isn't hiring, right? You see the signs out there. They know when they're ready, they'll get a job right away. They're not going to worry about whether they get a job or not. They just say, anticipate, I'm gonna go get a job when I'm, when I'm ready to go back to work. I think that mentality has affected that lower pay scale. Does anybody agree with that, disagree with that? You had a question back there. I guess maybe in a way it's a little bit more of an observation, but I'm interested to hear more about the mental health aspect. And in our case, and maybe a lot of other manufacturers, it's compounded by some of the supply chain disruptions. So you have the COVID punching gut, as you said, and then you have these supply chain disruptions, which in the coatings industry seems like we're one of a handful of industries that are maybe at the epicenter with all of it. And people are not able to do their job. Okay, we are not getting products shipped on time. We're not hitting our schedules. We're not able to satisfy customers. And we're not the only one, so it's not like we're getting kicked out. But the people inside the organization don't know that they're the only, not the only ones able to do this. And so there's a lot of stress that people who have traditionally operated at a high level cannot operate at a high level. And I think this is contributing to the mental health. So you have this two-sided thing. And so um, what's your experience with that, I guess? So they feel off balance. Yeah, well, you know, what do they say about athletes when they retire? You know, the thing that made, that was the center of their life is not the center of their life anymore. They go through this mental adjustment. So if you come to work every day, you can't do your job that you're good at because of all of these external factors. Are they worried about losing their job? Is that the, the portion of it? Or? Well, I think it's that fundamental thing where you are tied up in your capabilities. You know, people have higher performance. Yeah. You know, they, their self-worth is in their capabilities. So I don't know what to do about it. Um, I think that's opportunities to train people. I mean, how, I don't know how much dead time you have. I mean, if, they're, if, if, if somebody's running, you know, a line of equipment and they literally are sitting there for eight hours and not turning it on, I guess that's a whole different situation. But if they're just running a lighter, if they're used to doing a certain amount of production and it's shrunken down. More likely they're getting switched to do something else that wasn't part of what they were doing before because that's what we can do today based on what materials came in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's an opportunity for other to expose them to other things within the organization. I know that's not what they want to hear, but it, to me, it's all communication. Like, here's what here's what we're hearing in the market right now. Here's what you're used to producing. Um, 
and the company's okay, but here's how we're going to operate right now. This might not this might not be exactly what you want right now, but this is what we have to do to get through it. And I I I believe in keeping pe people mentally busy. If you can somehow come up with a way to keep them mentally busy, it's fine. It's when they have too much time to think about things that they start to get nervous about things. It, I mean, I know I'm that way. So. I think when you talk about agility, though, you know, people don't like change, and that's been, from a mental health standpoint, the hardest thing I think with COVID and probably yeah. going forward is if you are going to be extremely agile, that requires you to be comfortable with change or get to be more comfortable with change. So how do you? create that, sh shift that mindset from one of a fixed mindset to being to being more comfortable being uncomfortable, if that makes sense. I, I don't know the, the direct answer. All I would say, all I would say from a company standpoint is communicate to your employees as much as possible. Transparency, communicate with them, tell them what you're thinking about things. Um, you know, you can be very vulnerable. If any of you read Brene Brown, you can be very vulnerable and share that with your team, right? To, to a degree. Um, and talk about, hey, this is what's going down. This is how we feel about it. Here's what we're worried about. And here's what we want to focus on to get everybody through it. <coughs> Don't. That's one uh, Just real, real quick comment. I, I guess your underlying comment was to kind of wake up small business owners with your presentation. Because with one disease, COVID-19, it's changed the total view of small business owners about how we can operate a business if we have 100 employees or less. So I now have to hire a full-time HR person who's got to have a legal background to keep me out of constant uh, bickering or issues about people want time off, people want this, people want that. And I don't, I don't have the budget to do that as a small employer. So how do I, and, and one little disease, <clears throat> like COVID-19, is found out that your father was a great role model, but I can't find that employee who wants to work because there are other things he or she can do to get off legally from being a bona fide employee for me as the employer. So what's going on with the societal situation, the culture that you deal with and help employers prepare for that? So eight, so, we, there's a lot in there, Bob. So I, mean, I like, to, I, I could, I could talk for about 45 minutes. It's a simple message you gave me today. I, I would say that the company owns their HR functions, not a person. So you can, we, we use a fractional CFO. We use a fraction. So Greg Gens, uh, fractional CFO group, focus CFO. We use a fractional operations person, project person. You don't have to, it's not always a hired in position. You can, you can bring an expert in and out wherever you get that expert from, right? And they can help set you on thing, but they're also going to have to train you or one of your managers to help the people initiatives. And it never ends. This does not stop. It's relentless. You just keep going and going and going with it. The company owns the recruiting. The company owns the HR. It's not an individual person. The moment's in an individual person is the moment it's going to fail or be inconsistent. So as far as you know, the work and the type of workers that are out there, don't hire them. Garbage in, garbage out. I mean, I, I, you know, it's easier said than done. Easier said than done. All right. Thank you, guys. We got a small token we'd like to give our speakers. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for your time and All sharing right. with us. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming.